okay very good morning everyone hope all of you are fine and safe uh, let's start let me to share my screen first can you see my screen now yes, yes. okay today actually we will start with two-way ANOVA uh, before the break, we hope that finish with two-way ANOVA because I think most of you are familiar with the ANOVA, repeated measure ANOVA. And then uh, after break, we will start with the reliability and factor analysis, and then we will end it by the regression analysis uh, this session. Uh, okay, so uh, what does it mean, two-way ANOVA? Any idea? And why do we need to do the two-way ANOVA? Any idea? I know all of you are familiar with one-way ANOVA. We, we talk about one-way ANOVA. The one-way ANOVA is a kind of... Uh, hold on, please. The one-way ANOVA, we have only one factors. For example, we have a grouping factors. And then we try to compare, for example, group A, B, C. You remember the three factories and lifetime of their products yesterday? It was one way because there is only one source of variation. And when you have only one source for variation, then you can, you can run the one-way ANOVA. So we do the one-way ANOVA. So the two-way ANOVA, there is another grouping factors. So means in your study, you have two source of variation. Two source of variation. In this uh, case, we need to run the two-way ANOVA. So, but can you give me some example of two-way ANOVA? Any idea? Hello? Hi, Dr. Mahmoud. Can I yes. share my example? Okay, for two-way ANOVA, if I have two sets of red, one is injected, so I call it, um, say, injected red and non-injected red. But then I sacrifice the rest at two different points of time. So then I have like four different groups. That True. Means but yeah, you are right. But remember the time is within subject factor, right? Means the subjects will be exposed at two times, right? Will be measured. The time is a within subject factors. That's why. Uh, if the time is independent factors, mm -hmm. yes. But if the time is something dependent, means each subject or experimental unit uh, will be a measure over the time, then it is not a two-way ANOVA. It's repeated, is it? Yes, it is repeated. Oh, okay. So then but what, what I'm talking is about two-way ANOVA. In this two-way ANOVA, the subjects are independently at different combination of two factors from each other. So there is no paired observation or repeated measure observation. Suppose that, let me to give you an example. Uh, this is study, right? Can you see this study? We will analyze this study later together. So this study, as you can see here, the researcher wants initially to study the effect of three dosage of, uh, what do you call it, a medication, a drug. So this is one factor. At the same time, researcher also wants to see factor one. At the same time, researcher wants to lo look at the impact or effect and differences across two levels of gender. So means this is the second factors. There is no repeated measure ANOVA. Each subject has only single observation. So this is second factors, right? 
This is a typical example of two-way ANOVA or two-factor two uh, study. Remember, especially in the experimental study, not in survey, of course, in survey also it can be applied, but basically this kind of analysis is, is more applicable when you are dealing with experimental study. So the researcher wants to study the effect of two factors. Why? Because uh, when you, there is, I mean, in all techniques or term of analysis is, if you want to analyze one time the impact of dosage, so maybe, of course you can do the one way ANOVA. And if you want to look at the effect of gender, you can do the T-test. But the problem is here, the univariate analysis is a variance, means one factor at a time, will not give you the interaction between these two factors. What does it mean, interaction? Look at this example. So in this example, it's, I just want to explain the definition of interaction. Like, let me to Excel, okay, let me to open my Excel. Can you see my Excel? Yes. 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 Okay, good. Assume that I don't know what's wrong with this. It should close. Okay. Suppose that you are looking at the the time spending time on social media among female and male in the rural and urban area, right? So this is the average time that female spend on social media every day, the male in rural area, and then same for the urban area, right? So let me to give you another example here. Uh, two, four, and then four, eight. So look at here. In this example, if I draw the charts, the line charts, as it can be seen here, the amount of the time that, uh, what do you call it, the female spend, the pattern are almost parallel, right? So means the in both location, in the rural area, let me to change the, okay, so in the rural area, as it can be seen here, Female are, and also the urban area, the female are spending less time on social media compared to the male. So this two line shows almost same behavior, right? So when you try to draw the plots, you can see two almost parallel line. When there is parallel line, it indicates that there is no, what you call it, interaction between location and gender. So because one factor is here is gender, the other factors is the residential area. So in both, uh, what you call it, rural and urban, the female spend less time compared to the, and this difference almost same. I think it should be 100% same. Why? Uh, let me to check my data. So this is female, male, four, six, sorry. Okay, so as it can be seen here, the amount of the time, the differences between male and female in the rural area is two hours, and the same differences you can see between male and female in the urban area, right? So this parallel line indicates that there is no interaction between gender and residential area. 
when you draw the cross, uh, what do you call it? Uh, it's a cross tabulation. When you draw the plot for this cross tabulation observation or mean, you can see this pattern. When you see this pattern, means there is no interaction between gender and rural area. And look at here, compared to this graph, if I just if I just move it here to insert, draw the charts. So look at here, but in compared to this graph, as it can be seen here, the behavior of gender across two locations are totally different. Means in the rural area, male spend more time compared to the female, while in the urban area, my computer a bit slow, I don't know what's wrong. <laughs> it's okay. In the urban area, male has spent less than female. It means the gender behave different across two residential area. So that's why we say that there is an interaction between gender and location. So when they cross each other, or maybe sometimes not necessarily cross in the graph, so even as long as they are not parallel, maybe you, this, you, you find that they are uh, what do you call it? They have interaction. So the interaction is very important. Why? Especially look at this example. We want to look at the effects of this drop on two gender, right? We, what, what we actually we want to know if the drug has no interaction with gender, so then you can use a very unique uh, instruction for using this drug. But if drug, if this drug has different impact or behavior among male compared to the female, then maybe you come with two instruction, instruction for male and instruction for the female. So it means the gender is another contribut contributing factors on the outcomes, which has interaction with the dose. That's why it is not advised to compare only dosage and one time male and female, because if you compare it individually, these two factors, you will not be able to explore the interaction. And interaction is the most important factors. Uh, let me give you an example, another example. I had a student a few years ago, uh, in another university, UKM, if I'm not mistaken, or UPM, what what happened? He studied agriculture. What happened? He applied a fertilizer, nitrogen, with different level, 50 kg and 100 kg and 200, if I'm not mistaken. So when he compared the subject, he run a study, he run a study and he applied these treatments on the, some plants and then he compared and he found that the best performance for the plants is 100 kg. And after this, he applied another fertilizer, which was potassium, if I'm not mistaken, or phosphorus. And that phosphorus also he applied, for example, four level, 5 kg, 10 kg and 20 kg. And then he run another study and he analyzed this data and results found that the best performance belonged to the 20 kg. So does it mean that, but, but in the real world, all the farmers, they apply the nitrogen and phosphorus, correct? Together. So does it mean if you want to recommend to farmers to apply these two fertilizer, 100 plus 20 is the best? What happened? 
it went it work. Because, yeah it does not work not necessarily why because these two chemicals fertilizer they have some interaction so when we talk about interaction there are two type of interaction synergic effect and antagonistic effect right so what what does it mean on synergic effect so it means two plus two will not be four it will be eight antagonist means two plus two probably will be one so it means sometimes the effect is a synergic effect it's not additive so when this is positive this is positive but when you apply it together you will you will see the negative effects so it is very important in many experimental studies especially in field of science biological science engineering chemistry correct to study many factors together so today i'm going to teach you only two way fact two way anova but it it it's a kind of extension of three way anova four way anova multiple factors why because at the end of a story you want to optimize the situation and find the best combination of them because all these factors probably has in sort of interaction among them analyzing individually it's not recommended in advanced level for example there are some advanced level like uh, techniques or like like RSM response surface methodology it's a kind of analysis is actually basically it is based on the same concept but in RSM you can apply more than 10 factors at the same time with low for example um, what do you call it um, replication so and one of the softwares is design expert right those people who work with the uh, uh, in in field of science engineering chemical biological science experimental study this this is one of the best software to design the experiment and design expert is one of the softwares mine is out of uh, it's expired sorry this design expert is a fact is a, is a techniques uh, that you can apply more than two factors at the same time so means you don't need another example i i i had a student uh, uh, i i remember long time ago in food technology and he wanted to study the effect of eight factors on food uh, stability or something quality and what happened he ran eight different experiment and from each experiment he came with some results but the problem is that when he try to combine the best solution of this eight experiments the result was terrible the outcome why because all these factors as i mentioned they have sort of interaction look at here in medical science you want to come to optimize the dose for a general dose for people maybe you for maybe sometimes this dose correct of medication can interact with the age so that's why in some of drugs if you look at the instruction they advise you age below 12 maximum one dose per day age for example 12 to 25 they can use two day two dose and above 50 for example they never they it is not recommended so how they come with this kind of result or instruction by experiments and of course they applied a different level of age different dosage and then they find the optimized level is it clear now yes thank you okay. doctor so now we want to uh, now we want to analyze this data two way anova it's very simple don't worry as long as you understand the concept the analysis is is very simple so uh, i want to enter the data to spss first of all let me to open my spss okay how many factors oh, in this study how many iv and how many dv do i have hello Uh, first of all, IV. What are the independent variables? 
gender. Gender is one independent variable, right? Correct. You are right. Yes. Any other yeah. variables? Those yes. also is independent variables. Thank you. What is the dependent variable? Dependent variable was the response. For example, this is something like uh, I don't know. It's not. It cannot be blood pressure, of course. <laughs> Suppose that this is one uh, kind of uh, outcome in the patient. So this outcome is your DV, right? So you have three level and two level of two IV. So now when I'm going to enter the data, so I just put the first is gender. The second is those. And the last one is response. My DV. Right? So this is my DV. IV1, IV2, and DV. So now remember you have to report, you have to put your uh, data in sort of uh, what you call it, the uh, three column and identify all the IV and DV together. So even here, let me to make it a smaller. So now look at here, this is input, input, and this can be your target, correct? So means your output, the rule. In the in the latest version of SPSS, you can identify the role of the, the variables. Okay, so how can I enter my data to SPSS? Very simple. So this is gender one, gender one, gender two, those one, those two, and those three. Remember, data entry is the it's one of the most important part of uh, what you call it the uh, data analysis. Some students they they enter their data wrongly, and then they will not be able to analyze the data. This is a problem. But how can I transfer my data to SPSS? Very simple. As you know, I like to use the Excel. So what I'm going to do. I select all these table in Excel form. So remember, finally, we want to come with these those. This is the replication, uh, gender, those, and IV. Actually, replication means because for each of them, we have four replication. In experimental study, these are called replication. We use the replication to be able to estimate the sampling error, right? So now what I'm going to do, paste this data. So now this is male and this is female, correct? So this is those one. So what I'm going to do, instead of male and female, I just want to insert, I just put one, 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 and two, 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 two. Control C and then I just control V. This is for the dose number two. So now I need to create another one. This is gender. And this is dose. I just copy the first dose. This is the first dose. And then this is the second dose. I need to take out these numbers and put it here. OK, and then the last one, again, the same gender. And then the last dose, those three. And then easily we can just copy this one and paste it here. Of course, we have four replication. It's not necessary, but better to keep it one, two, three, four, because each treatment replicated four times. Correct. That's all. We just copy this data from Excel and then we just paste it in SPSS. Of course, I need to add one more variable here. As uh, So I just paste it. So this is gender and this is replication. Rep. So then that's why the gender, we just put one is male 
who is female those one is 10 mg 10 milligram two is 40 mg if i'm not mistaken or no no hold on uh, 10 40 70 yeah 40 mg and three is 70 mg Add. that's all correct i just converted my data from this form into right and format for being analysis so just save my data i just save my data two way two way anova data save it okay now what i need to do data are ready for analysis i need to analyze data and check the normality of data right so can you tell me how many groups do i have right now how many groups do i have here six six yes correct we have six we have six group thank you so what about the replication doctor sorry Do we replicate the outcome is it i, I mean the i'm not sure about i'm not clear about the replication replication is the number of subjects who ex who has been exposed to the same treatments for example we because we cannot use only single observation under each treatment so replication is your uh, what do you call it sample size something like that in experimental study we replicate we do the replicate why because we are able to calculate the error what do you call it we call it uh, you if you remember when we run the one way ANOVA if you remember for example if, if I just put those and response look at here this is one way ANOVA for those right so can you see here within group variance the within groups variance can be calculated if you have replication by single observation you cannot calculate the variance okay. Yep. Okay. that's why in all experimental study actually single observation it is not possible to check the variance right so uh, let me to open the previous slide yesterday So look at here, this is one way ANOVA. Treatment A, treatment B, treatment So the point is that by single observation, I cannot, I cannot estimate the variance within groups. And the variance within groups is a measure of your accuracy. So less variance within group means you are you have done your study in a correct way with less bias so in all experimental study we need replication single observation cannot be analyzed clear yes clear okay so we have replication because we ha we need to collect more data right uh, to be able to estimate a better estimation this is the minimum number of sample per each group actually for experimental study the sample size does not follow some formula like cross-sectional study i'm not going to talk about sample size calculation but definitely for the experimental study since the researcher try to control all the conditions then it can be it can be possible to reduce the number of sample per each groups especially suppose that you do this study in experimental conditions in the lab and all the samples are for example the rats these experimental uh, what do you call it uh, animals are genetically identical the all the conditions are same so that's why you control all the factors except these two factors these two factors under your control you manipulate gender and dose any changes in outcome 
will will depend on these two factors because all other factors is under your control. In experimental study, the researcher always uh, try to reduce the bias by controlling all other factors. That's why you do not need to collect too much samples compared to the human-based study. Correct? For the human-based study, when you want to study these factors, because humans are not, for example, genetically identical, there are a lot of factors affecting, we call it confounding factors. So by increasing sample size in human study, we try to control and reduce the effect of unknown confounding factors. So this is the, this is the difference between science, uh, what do you call it, the pure science and uh, human-based science. In human-based science, when you do a study in education, in linguistic, in accounting, in management, in medicine, the sample size should be should be larger compared to the people who study in, in, in the lab, in field of science, chemistry, engineering. Why? Because they can control all the conditions on their experimental unit. So they can fix all other confounding factors. They can remove it easily. For example, they can remove the diet from these rats. They can give the, they can fit all these rats similar. Temperature, same. Light, same. Water, same. Everything, they, they can control it. So that's why a few subjects are enough to do the study. So in, in experimental study, the sample size always per each group is not recommended to be more than five or six, I mean the replication. But if you want to do this study among human-based, then of course you need to collect more data. Why? Because peoples are totally different. Age, gender, ethnicity, I don't, a lot of factors, hidden factors that we don't know. But when you increase the sample size, you try to neutralize all these compound factors because if there is, uh, for example, Chinese, we have a Malay. If we have uh, old people, we have a young people. We try to reduce all these confounding factors compared to the experimental studies. I, I actually, I avoid to explain too much because I'm afraid that you're confused. But anyhow, as a, as a, as a, as an advice, if you are dealing. Uh, with experimental study, you don't need to, especially when you are controlling all the conditions in your experimental studies, you do not need to collect more data. So replication is more applicable term in field of pure science, techno I mean, the biotechnology, chemistry, physics, because the researcher able to control all those unknown factors. Okay, back to our study. So here we have uh, dose and we have gender. Totally we have six groups. So first of all, we have to check the normality for all the six groups separately. So then what I need to do? Okay, better to create another variable here. So this is group one. This is group two. This is group three. This is group four. This is group five, and this is group six. So, in a simple way, you can do one way ANOVA, and then you can compare six groups. But when you compare all these six groups, you will not be able to understand the interaction between these two factors. Okay, I just use this group to test the normality of my data. I go to the explore and then use this group as a factor list and then response. And then we try to check the normality plot. So since my sample size is small, I just look at the Kolmogorov of test. Look at here. Uh, according to the Shapiro week, all the p-value except number three are not uh, statistically significant. So number three, we have an outliers probably. We go here. Yeah, number three is very, what do you call it, the, the, the range, there is no any, uh, what do you call it, the Q1 and Q2, Q2 and Q3 are 
same Q3 and 4 also same. So that's why the range of data are very limited. But still, we can ignore it if the skewness and cortices are acceptable. But as it can be seen here, the skewness is zero, but cortices is minus six. Correct? So it means it's kind of platycortex. So probably we have a similarity among our data. Number six. Yeah, they are very close to each other, less variation compared to the other groups. Okay, just ignore it. I just want to ignore it because the skewness is zero. I'm still okay with that. And of course, this is the minimum number of replication. I just want to teach you how to do it. So then if I want to do that two-way ANOVA, I need to go to the GLM and then general linear model. Yesterday, we talked about repeated measure. Now we talk about univariate analysis of variance. Now look at here. This is your dependent. The factors is your gender and those. Under model, as it can be seen here, it is full factorial model. What does it mean? Full factorial model means the effect of dose, the effect of gender, and their interaction. So you don't actually, when it's full factorial, you don't need to do it manually because it will give you the same source of variation. And remember, the most important effect in uh, two way ANOVA is gender dose interaction. We don't care about the overall effect of dose or overall, of overall, of overall effect of gender. We are looking for this interaction. Okay, I just skip it and I don't change it, but it is possible for you to build your own model. Remember, in, in the in SPSS, you are, you, are, you are able to create your own models. So under plot, we put those in horizontal. It's to almost look like the two-way repeated measure ANOVA, right? Continue, and then under E means, I can put the effect of gender, effect of dose, and interaction, but again, we have the same problem. The comparison only can be done for the main effect. I mean, the comparison between gender and dose, not for the, uh, what do you call it? The interaction. So under options, Descriptive statistic, effect size, and homogeneity test. That's all. We just click OK and then run it. So this is your descriptive statistic. The mean and standard deviation of two gender at three dosage. Look at here. I just want to directly go to the to the Plot, is there any interaction, do you think? Or no, both male and female, they have similar pattern. What do you think? No interaction. No interaction, because gender, male and female, they have same behavior. Of course, in male, the response was significantly, probably was higher than, than if I just rescale this graph, it will be much more better for you. Suppose that if I, change my scale from 0 to 50, maximum, minimum. Then, yeah. So now look at here. This graph shows almost similar pattern. At 40 mg, the lowest response was observed for male and female. Correct? There is no different pattern across male and female. Suppose that if you want to advise the best dosage, then we advised 40 mg because it will, it probably, it was better because it was able to reduce, for example, the outcome and we, ex we expect for the reduction in outcomes. So according to these results, 40 mg for both gender works same. Correct? Is it clear? So now, the graphically, yes, but statistically, we have to prove it. So look at here. This is descriptive statistic. This is the homogeneity test of variance. Unfortunately, the variances among six groups are not equal. It means we have different variance in, as you can see here, let me to copy this table. As it can be seen 
in this table, the variances of these three groups and these three groups are not same. Some of groups we have more variation. Some of groups we have very small variation. But as the sample size for all groups are same, based on some of the references, we can ex we can ignore these assumptions. So means the homogeneity test of variance, despite the variances are not same, but some of references, the statistician believe that since the sample size are equal, then we can ignore this assumption and then we can proceed with the ANOVA table. And this is the ANOVA table, the most important part. So let me to again copy this table here and then let explain it here. So this is the ANOVA table. In the ANOVA table, we just look at these three effects. So look at here. Is there any significant overall between gender? Yes yeah. or no? Yes. Yes. So means this drug, the, sorry, not this drug. The, the output, the outcome was significantly different between male and female. Of course, in the charts, in the graph also, it is very clear that female has overally, they had at, at three different level of dosage. Overally, they are more than male. Okay, this is the main effect of gender. It is significant, right? Okay. So now, now we look at the second impact. So this is called main effect of gender. This is main effect. What is this? Dose. Is there any differences among dosage over Ali? Yes. 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 Thank you very much. This is the these two are main effect. And this is the interaction. Is there any interaction between gender and dose? No. 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 Statistically, no. So this is the point. And the in, this is effect size. Actually, effect size of gender interaction between gender and dose on outcome was very small. Very small. So means it is not statistically significant. Correct? So means then ignoring ignoring the we can we can come with a single solution since there is no interaction correct that's why we can advise both gender they can use 40 mg as a best dosage that reduce the outcomes suppose that this is the pain score so these two uh what do you call it let me to copy this one So now, suppose that this is pain score. We found that the lowest pain score can be seen at, for both gender, at 40 mg. So this is the recommended dose for both female and male. Clear? Yes. Thank you, okay, now, now I want to do something. Now I want to do something. And let's to look at here. So I just want to run analysis. I just modified some observation here. I just do the univariate analysis and then and then I just repeat the analysis. Are they same? No. So what does it mean? No. It means this dosage, this dosage behave, act differently for both gender. In the female, the best dosage is 40 mg, while among male, 
by increasing the dose, still the pain is reduced. So if we want to re recommend a specific dosage for the female, it will be 40 mg, while for the male, probably 70 mg is the best dosage, right? So this graph, this graph indicates interaction why because if i draw if i look at here this this line and this line if i if i con sorry if i continue this line and this line it will cross they will cross each other so it means they are different behavior they are not same one is decreased and then again increase, but this is still decreasing. So this is different behavior. So when it's different, there is different behavior, then you can see the interaction. Of course, the interaction here is not significant. Let me to change it a little bit. <laughs> so at 70 mg here, I just make it 50, 50, 40 and then 50. So now if I run it again, let me to univariate, I have to, this, there is a problem in the my SPSS that every time I have to so I need to again So now, look at the interaction. Copy this one. Okay, now, is it, again, just look at these three impact. Are they, are they, are the genders are different? Yes. yes. Those? Yes. Yes. Interaction? Yes. 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 So it means, and the RA score of the model, this is the all, all the models, remember, they have a goodness of fit. So it means these three fact these two factors plus gender, they are able to explain eighty almost seventy-seven percent of changes in outcome. So look at here, what will be happen? If I exclude the interaction from the model, suppose that if I just put gender and those in model, look at here, what will be happen? Look at the R square of the model. The R square of the model is how much now? 61%. And look at the those, those significant, Look at here, I, I remove the interaction from the model and I just keep the gender and those. Gender is significant, those is significant? No. 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 Look at the RA score of the model. How much is the RA score of, of model? 61%. Comparing to 78%, 61% means we almost lost. Correct? 70% of changes or variance, and this 70% belong to the interaction. So it means this model, this model compared to a full factorial model with interaction term has less fitting index. And of course, this is totally wrong because you, you did not include the interaction and probably there is, so that's why sometimes we try we do try, to, what do you call it, try and error, we, we add some sort of interaction into the model. Okay, now, when we run the model with a full factorial, again, I have to, <laughs> I don't know what's wrong with my PSS every time. In the model, I just use the full factorial. 
Okay, there is something that I don't want to discuss about. It's a bit a bit advanced. There are four types of sum of a square calculation because you know the ANOVA is based on the sum of a square of error. So there are many different types of the sum of a square, and the type three is much more. Uh, if the sample size are equal, type three is the best solution. But if you have some issue, okay, of course, if you if you are interested, you can go through the. Uh, this uh, teacher, the teacher is here always, correct? You can just click and you can find the, the explanation of the sum of a square, correct? Uh, usually the sum of a square is the commonly used techniques for balanced or unbalanced models with no missing data. But if you have missing data, then you can reduce the type error one or four. Uh, if you are interested, maybe you can find and explain, uh, find more details under SPSS guideline, correct? So there are small explanation here about this type error one, type error two, type error three, which is most commonly techniques, and type error four, uh, especially when you have missing data, as I mentioned, you can apply this model. Uh, Okay, so of course, as a postgrad, and some of you, of course, maybe are lecturer or researcher, then you can go through and find the, the definition and explanation more about it. Okay, that's all. So this is two full factorial, two fixed factors. Okay, remember here we have random factors. Uh, of course, this can be discussed at advanced level, but remember, um, there are two types of factors in factorial experiments. Fixed factors means researcher prior to conduct the researcher already knows about that, already knew about the level of the factors, because gender for me is on, is, is well-known factors, male, female. The dose, the level of the dose already before starting the research was clear for me. But if you have some factors with unknown levels, categories, that the categories probably is a random category we don't know, like income category, it depends on the situation of data, some random factors can be used in the model under this section. So we have three types of model. We have fixed model, random model and mixed model. If all the factors that you are studying are fixed, then the model will be fixed model. If all the factors are random, then the model will be random. But if it's combination between fixed and random factors, then it will be called mixed model. Okay, for the covariate, I will explain after the break, correct? But right now, we go to the E-means. And then again, we select all these things, compare the mean, and Bonferroni, continue, and then paste. Uh, if I run the analysis is here, you can see here, uh, we explained the ANOVA table. Now we move to the pairwise comparison. The same problem as repeated major ANOVA. Now we have comparison between male and female, but we don't care about it. We want to compare female and male at different dosage, right? And the, again, this is the dosage. This is the pairwise comparison of dosage. But we want to compare it for female and male separately. So these tables are not applicable. They are not usable. What shall I do? In the syntax, same as yesterday. Oops, what happened? And same as yesterday, gender and dose, these two lines should be modified. We select this interaction we copy here and we copy here. After compare, we open a bracket. We say, for example, those. Second, after the bracket, we put the second factors. Gender. Now we run it. When you run it, you can see here, look at here, the comparison between dosage among the male. Okay. Among male, is there any significant between, let me to copy this table in Excel file. 
paste. Oops. Is there any difference between 40 milligram and 10 milligram among male? No. No. Between 10 and 70? No. So 40 and 70? No. No. So means there is no difference among different level of dosage among the male. Why? Among female, is there any difference between 40 and 10? No. No. 10 with 70? Yes. yes. 40 with 70? No. Yes. Yes or no? Yes. 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 So, as you can see here, uh, the differences uh, among groups, among dosage, are different in female and male. So this is this is comparison among different dosage for each gender. Now I have another table. So the next table is comparison between male and female. Let me to copy this table. So now this table shows the comparison between gender at different dosage. Is there any significant differences between male and female at 10 mg? Yes. Yes. Is there any difference between male and female at 4, 4 mg? Yes. And 70 mg? Yes. So yes. these two tables support the interaction because we have different pattern, especially in the next, in the first table. Among male, nothing significantly change. While among female, we have a significant behavior at different dosage. And this is support our, what you call it, interaction effects, as it can be seen here in the interaction effect here. We found that the gender dose are interact Tip. Is it clear now? Yes. Yes. So now uh, we stop for almost 20 minutes. You have a break and then we will be back uh, at 1030. Is okay? Okay. Thank you, doctor. So okay, doctor. take rest and drink coffee. Refresh yourself for the second round. Okay, one more thing before you leave. I just want to mention, yes, all of you will receive, will receive my, uh, a copy of my slides. And I try to also attach some references or statistical book, uh, I mean the soft copy, to share with you. Uh, hopefully by next week. During the weekend, I will try to prepare the package for you. <laughs> and then Monday through the edX, you will receive the documents. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Hello. Hello, doctor. OK, are we ready to start? Yes, doctor. OK, good. So now after uh, explanation about two way uh, uh, analysis of variance, uh, briefly I just want to mention something about the covariance because uh, basically when you run a study, uh, sometimes your outcomes probably can be correlated with some other confounders. And in, to, in order to exclude the effect of some, some confounding factors, then you need to exclude the probable effect of all these confounders. But what you need to do when you run the, you see my screen, right? Yes. 
Okay, so let me to go back to data and then hold on, please. Uh, just save it as, yep. <clears throat> Let me to open my file. Okay. When you run the analysis of variance, univariate analysis of variance, sometimes uh, maybe some of the variables uh, like demographic variables, socio-demographic variables, or other factors may be correlated with your outcomes. So means beside your main factor, may you need to add some other variables as a covariates to exclude the probable effect of your, uh, what do you call it, uh, subjects. Let's say that in this study, hold on, uh, two-way ANOVA, okay, here. Suppose that in this study, also, we have the age of respondents. And then, uh, and the age of respondents, uh, for example, let me to show, to do something, hold on, please. Um, I need to create the age. Okay, hold on, I need to go back. So this is suppose that this is the age. Okay. Suppose that the age of resp the respondents are out of your control and we want to see whether the age also has any impact on the response or not. Shall I use age as a confounding or not? In order to do that, what you need to do, first of all, you need to check the correlation between age and your outcomes. If these two variables are significantly correlated, like here, as it can be seen here, the age and response to measure the correlation, actually, uh, I will discuss after this about the correlation, but as it can be seen here, in order to do, to do the correlation, we go to the bivariate, and then we put the age and outcomes, and then we run the correlation coefficient. The correlation coefficient is significant, so means age is significantly correlated with the outcomes. And if I do comparison, if I do the comparison between uh, those and gender for the response without including the age, because age is probably is not same, and it is correlated with outcomes. So we need to add the age as a covariate in the analysis. When you run this analysis, let me to copy this table. So as it can be seen here, the age Is there any significant effect of age in outcomes? No. No. But sometimes, if age is significant, you can still keep it in the model and correct your model based on this covariate. In the analysis, 
as you can see here, I put the age as a covariates. Prior to analysis, I found that the age is correlated with the response, but it was not statistically, uh, what you call it, consider as a potential covariate. Why? Because when I added in as a, as a covariate in my analysis, the results of this covariate was not a statistically significant. So that's why I can drop it. But if this age, according to the F value and P value in two-way repeated measure ANCOVA, right now we don't call it two-way repeated measure ANOVA, we call it two-way, sorry, two-way ANCOVA. Why ANCOVA? Because we have one covariate, which is age. So sometimes when there are many factors or variables that potentially can affect on your outcome, you need to add them to the model and see whether uh, they, they are significant or not. If they are significant, then you have to keep it. If they are not significant, then you can drop them from the model. But at, at least when you add the significant one, the impact of the main factors will be adjusted. So means the real impact of gender dose and gender dose will be adjusted according to, the, according to those confounders or covariates. So in the, real, in the real situation, sometimes maybe you need to do the covariate analysis. And of course, for the covariate analysis, you need to check first whether they are correlated with the DV or not. If they are correlated, then you can enter to them to the model. The only problem is one of the assumptions uh, that you need to check is the homogeneity of regression slope. So means the effect of covariates on DV across different groups should be same. Correct? I'm not going to talk about this in details because it's about advanced statistical analysis in the future. If I run the stat advanced statistical uh, analysis workshop, I will explain more in depth. But at this level, what you need to know, at least you need to know that if there is any potential covariates, it should be added into model to adjust the, what you call it, the effect of the main factors unless there is no significant relationship or there's significant effect, then you can drop it from the model. By adjusting the model, the impact of the main factors, in this study we had three effects, the result will be more accurate, a, what you call it, a corrected, uh, what you call it, version of analysis by adding some covariates. Okay. So that is all for uh, covariate analysis. Before moving to exploratory analysis, I need to go back to my first slides. Then we discuss about correlation. Hold on, please. And now we are going to talk about association. Where is the slide? <laughs> I cannot find it. Okay, this is slide. Whatever we have discussed till now is about uh, comparison. And now I'm going to teach you very simple way and easy way how to measure the relationship at bivariate level. Uh, using a SPSS. This table actually makes it very simple for you. When you are planning to do a relationship test or correlation between uh, two variables, what you need to do only because when we talk about correlation, we need at least two variables, right? Clear? So what you need to do? First, just check the type of variables. If two variables are normally distributed and they are quantitative, then you need to do the Pearson correlation coefficient. 
if the variables, one of them, both quantitative, but one or both of them are not normally distributed, then you can use the Spearman correlation coefficient. If one variable is quantitative, no matter normal or not normal, but the second variable is ordinal, again, you can apply the Spearman correlation coefficient. In SPSS, all these three S tests are available under analyze, correlate, bivariate. So means if I go to If I go to analyze, correlate, bivariate, then you can see here Pearson and Spearman correlation. Clear? Suppose that you want to see the relationship between these five domains of quality of life. Which one should I use, Spearman or Pearson? Hello? Pearson. Why? Why Pearson? Because it's quantitative and ordinal. Of course, we need to check the data, right? So first we have to look at the data. Are, are they quantitative or qualitative? As long as they have decimal numbers, means they are quantitative. But remember, we need to make sure that they are normally distributed. For using the Pearson, we have to make sure that they are normally distributed. So that's why what I need to do, I need to go to analyze first, explore, and then put all these variables and check the normality plot with test, right? Click OK. So now let's to look at the data. Askewness and cortices, very small. For the second components, between minus one to plus one. For the third components, PS, psychology, it's between minus one to plus one. For the social relationship, again, it's small. And then for the environmental, again, the askewness and cortices are within acceptable range. Of course, we don't look at these results because my sample is large, 260 subjects. But if you want, you can look at the QQ plot, box plot. We discussed about this yesterday, right? So I just ignore it. I assume that all my data are normally distributed. So that's why when I want to check the correlation, I go and check the correlation of among these components using Pearson correlation coefficient. As it can be seen here, the test of significance are available at two levels. Two-tailed and one-tailed. Shall I use two-tailed or one-tailed? Two-tailed. Why? What is your reason? <laughs> because the results can go either side. Yesterday, we discussed about two tail and one tail in detail. So it depends on your, it depends on your hypothesis. If your hypothesis are directional, or non-directional. So which one should I use? If the direction we use the one tail, non non direction we use the two tail. So this is one tailed and this is two tailed, right? But in this study I did not mention about the type of the hypothesis. That's why we cannot select. First you have to ask me, okay, Dr. Mahmoud, what are your hypotheses? Are they directional or non-directional? You need to ask me. Can you ask me now? <laughs> so what assume that assume that my hypothesis is, is directional because assuming that the components of the quality of life are positively correlated. 
So means if you have a better physical health, you have a better psychological health, you have a better social relationship, it is related to the environmental positively and overall quality of life, of, of course, will be positively correlated. So means all my hypotheses are directional. Then, shall I use the two tail or one tail? One tail. That's all, run it. Now this is the table. So when you want to report this table, don't copy paste this table. So let me to show you how you need to report this table in the right form. So you copy this table in Excel. Of course, we don't need the we don't need the numbers and p value. Academically, we don't need it. We just remove this table. And as it can be seen here, this number and this number are same. This number and this number are same. So means number above diagonal are same of the number below diagonal. It, 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 it is a symmetrical matrix, right? So that's why what we need to do. We just remove the numbers above. That's all. And then we copy, and then we report it like this. Control V, double click, and then select the format table. That's all. So remove the shadings, and then centralize it. So this is, we call it, uh, what do you call it, correlation matrix. To a star or a streak, it means your results are significant at 0, 0.0. Five level. Can you see here? Yes. Okay. What does it mean when we say that two variables are correlated? What does it mean? When two variables are highly correlated, what does it mean? They have the interaction. No, not interaction. <laughs> Association. Association. OK, let me to tell you something. When we talk about this is suppose that your X that this is the age and we have another variable which is blood pressure so this is the variation variance of blood pressure and this is the variation of or variance of age. So this area, this area, do you know what we call it? Do you know what, what we call it, this area? the green area. Co relationship. Covariance. Covariance. Co, co means common area between these two. Variance. This is the common variance. Common variance or covariance. The covariance actually is a form of unstandardized correlation. So this is the covariance. So the formula for the covariance is like this, x i minus x bar multiply by y i minus y bar divided by n minus 1. 
this is we call it covariance if i if i divide this value by the variance of x multiply by the variance of x then it will be converted to the correlation coefficient we call it we call it correlation coefficient the correlation coefficient range between minus 1 to plus 1 the plus 1 means a perfect relationship so means the area under curve suppose that two variables are highly correlated 100% so means the variance and covariance are same suppose that they are highly correlated one is age the other is blood pressure so means the variance is equal to covariance so means this is equal to the because variance of x and y is same so the the outcome will be equal to one the 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 sign indicating in get, indicating the direction of the relationship so let me to show you something when we talk about correlation coefficient So look at here, this is correlation, this is the relationship. A very large and positive or high correlation by increasing one variable, this variable, the other variables also are same. So means they are highly correlated positively. And here we have a negative correlation, sorry, negative relationship. So the Pearson correlation coefficient indicating when you report it, you need to talk about two things. First, the direction of the relationship and then the strength of relationship. If the absolute value of correlation close to one, indicating a strong relationship. So if you search, for example, in internet for cross correlation coefficient classification, you can see this table. Let me to copy this image. I lost my slide, I don't know. It should be within my slide, but I cannot find it. Sorry, but there, don't worry for the, I will I will add it later into my slides. I, I, I did it, but unfortunately, probably I did not save it. That's why I can't find it in my PowerPoints. Never mind. So look at here. When you want to describe the correlation coefficient, Pearson correlation coefficient, or a Spearman correlation coefficient, beside explanation about direction of the relationship, the strength of relationship can be classified as very weak, weak, moderate, strong, and very strong. If the R is below 0 0.2, we call it very weak relationship. Between 0.2 and 4, we call it weak. 4 to 6, moderate, six to eight strong and above eight we call it very strong relationship so there are several type of what you call it classification if you look at here there is another classification if i'm not mistaken maybe i can find it here some some people they classify it into less correlation coefficient classification yeah, this is uh, uh, the same classification. I'm looking for another one, which is three level. So, yeah, we, they call it only moderate, strong, and uh, I cannot find it, sorry. <laughs> yeah. There was a table, surprisingly, uh, when I always, when I search correlation coefficient classification, Pearson, Yeah, it is not here. Yeah, this is one. This is another classification. Below three, three to five, low, 
five to seven moderate, seven to nine high, and more than nine is very high. So no matter which kind of, uh, what you call it, table you use for interpretation, but as long as, this is another one, this is another, we call it guide fourth rule of thumbs, below two, four to seven, seven to nine, and more than nine. So no matter which kind of this table you use for interpretation of your result, as long as you refer to some of this reference, it is acceptable, correct? So remember, when we calculate the relationship between two variables, always beside, so beside the direction, we can look at the significance. So for each correlation coefficient, so you need to consider three things. First, direction, whether it's positive or negative. Second, is a strength, whether it's weak, moderate or high, for example. And the last is significance. So when you report a correlation coefficient in your writing, you need to identify and describe all these three components. Clear? Yes. If you want to write down the correlation coefficient classification, so look at here, if I go to all correlation coefficient, writing up APA. So now Pearson correlation coefficient in APA style. So please remember, whenever you want to write a correlation coefficient, please follow the academic style how to write it, how to report it correctly, to avoid any kind of issue regarding when you submit your articles or your thesis, make sure that you are following the academic style. So there will not be any issue if you report it correctly. So back to SPSS. This data, all of them are quantitative data and normally distributed. The highest correlation coefficient was observed among psychological and environmental, and it is positively correlated. It means when the quality of life in terms of environment increase, it is highly correlated, associated with the improvement in psychological domain in quality of life. Some of these correlation coefficients are very strong. Some of them are moderate, and probably only one of them below moderate. Again, again, depends on which guideline you are going to follow. But all of them are significant. SPSS make it easy for us because when you do the correlation coefficient by variate, can you see here flag significant correlation? If I don't select it, then there is no any numbers. Then you have to judge according to the p-value. Is it clear now? Yes. Any question? Okay. So, uh, is, yeah, in chat box, I can see one message from Chan Chung Chung that reporting a style for two, or should I include the effect size? Of course, effect size and partial eta square or omega should be reported. Yes. Okay, one more thing I just want to mention, I don't want to teach you. Remember, uh, in, the, in the latest version of SPSS, as it can be seen here, we have generalized linear model. So the GLM, the main assumption of the GLM is normality of your data, right? If, you, if your data does not meet, does not meet the assumption of normality, then instead of using GLM, you can use the generalized linear model. You don't need to go directly to the non-parametric test, but uh, the GLZ actually uh, can be discussed in advanced topics in the future. Hopefully, maybe by next two months, I can run advanced topics on statistics and SPSS only for those people who attended to the, what do you call it, to the intermediate and basic, I mean, the current workshop. 
otherwise there will be a lot of issues. Okay, so now back to this slide. Now we want to try a Spearman correlation. If data are not normally distributed, if data are not normally distributed, and uh, one of them is ordinal, then you can use a Spearman. So, okay, in my data, I have the income. This is income. Income is categorical data and ordinal data, right? So when you want to check the relationship between A7 with other outcomes, since A7 is an ordinal variable, what should I do? I need to run the correlation bivariate with A7, but this time I use a Spearman. Agree? Run it. So, oh, let me to just flag the relationship. So now look at here, this table, the first part, I don't need it. I just copy this table in Excel, paste it, and I don't need this part because I just want to look at the relationship between A7 and other components. So I just need this one also, I don't need. What I need is only the R correlation coefficient. So now look at here. This table is a summary of correlation between, if I want to report it. Can you mute your microphone? Sorry. Hello. Appreciate if you mute my, your microphone. So now look at here, I just copy this table, make it simple. Don't put many unnecessary information in your uh, table. So now, according to this table, as it can be seen here, let me to check the fonts, Times New Roman. Now, as it can be seen here, only social relationship and environment are positively correlated with what? With income. So this is the way that you need to report it. From the whole table, from the whole table, I just only need the last column, correct? Because in this objective, I wanted to check the relationship between quality of life components with the income. And I summarize it like this. So two of them are significant and positive, but not a strong relationship, correct? Because according, according to this guideline, the relationship below 0 0.2 is weak, very weak. And here, both of them are below 0 0.2. Agree? Hello? Yes. Agree. Yes. So, the yes, point agree. is here. Okay, yeah, one yeah. more. Let me to share with you something. The significance easily can be affected by what? By sample size, right? If I'm not mistaken, I showed you. Let me to show you another things. Just check, wait, wait, wait. Okay, look at this relationship. Is it significant or not? Uh, Dr. Dab, can you shoot the screen for us? I can you see the slide. Can you see my screen now? Yes, yes. Dr. No, can see. So look at here. I have X and Y. I check the correlation coefficient between these two variables. And this is the results. Is it significant? No. No. Why? Because it is more than 0 0.05. Look at here. How much is the relationship? 395. Look at here. Look at here, it's very simple. If I copy my data and paste it, and again I paste it, 
And again, I paste it. Do you think that the relationship will be changed? No. Look at here. I just try again. This table, 395, the relationship, the Pearson correlation is 0 0.395. And now look at here. How much is the correlation coefficient between variable 1 and variable 2? Sorry. Is it significant? Yes. Yes. So now, what happened? The correlation coefficient is still the same, but the only things what's happened is here we have I have 40 samples, and here I have 10 samples. So the significance, as I mentioned yesterday, it's your sampling error your confidence to generalize your pop to the, these results to the population. Of course, with a small sample size, you cannot generalize to the population. But you, when you increase your sample size, what happened? The, the correlation coefficient is still, the strength and direction is still same, but the p-value is less. So means you have more confidence to generalize this information to the population. Clear? Yeah, thank you. Okay, yes, one thank more, you. One more thing that I want to highlight here. Some of you maybe when, because the, the SPSS will, will not generate the confidence interval for correlation coefficient. The CI. So when you want to calculate the confidence interval, for correlation coefficient, you just Google it. Confidence interval correlation coefficient. So when you search, there are some uh, calculator that easily you can calculator so now easily you can calculate your this is actually the formula this text is the formula how to calculate it but when you want to calculate it what is your correlation coefficient 395 right in this 395 and sample size was 40 and confidence interval was how much 95 percent okay calculate so means this is your CI, and copy this one and report it. So this is your confidence interval for this correlation coefficient. The correlation coefficient in your sample was how much? 395. But if I repeat this study again and again and again and again and again, it is expected by 95% confidence the relationship between in the population or in repeating the study range between 0 0.9 to 0 0.62. Now I want to show you how the sample size will affect that because it is very wide range, right? from the weak to the strong relationship. But look at here, if I increase my sample size, now it is become 0 0.30 to 47. And if I make it 600, then it will be much, much more closer. So of course, if I increase the confidence interval, then the CI or all confidence interval also, sorry, confidence level also affect on your confidence interval. So means by 95% confidence interval, you can say that in the population, correlation probably will range between 3.2 to 4.6. It, it will not be zero. Clear? SPSS, unfortunately, does not, uh, uh, what do you call it, generate the confidence interval for correlation coefficient. Yep. There is no any 
options to to generate the confidence interval. But sometimes when you publish a paper, maybe the journals or the exam or the reviewer request to report your CI or confidence interval. Okay, clear? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. So now we move to the next topic. And the next topic is that when you have a nominal data with ordinal, nominal with nominal, and nominal with quantitative, then we use the chi-square test. Of course, there are several other tests, but I don't want to mention about it. Ordinal, ordinal can be used by Spearman that I explained to you, but there are some other tests like Kendall, Summers, and Gamma. But the common is the Spearman. But when you are dealing with the categorical data, how we can test, how we can test the relationship. Suppose that you want to see, is there any relationship between job and type of job? And for example, this is the, uh, what do you call it? This is job and type of companies, whether the company is private or government or labor. Or whether if you want to look at the relationship between income and what do you call it? Job position. So both of them are categorical data, right? So when you are dealing with categorical data, then you can do the cross tab. This is cross tab. Under descriptive statistic, it is cross tab. When you go to the cross tab, you can select the categorical data in the row and so look at here, when I click OK, this is the cross tab. Cross tab means cross tabulation. Two table cross each other. So if I copy this one and paste it here. So now this is the cross tab. Look at here. So how many people they receive salary less than 1,262? Out of, sorry, 61. Out of 61 subjects, how many of them from government? One. How many of them from private? 11. And how many of them are housewife? 49. The housewife also received the salary. Uh, hold on, please. I will join shortly. Uh, I'm sorry, I apologize, <laughs> sometimes urgent call. Okay, so back to these results. For those people who receive a salary between 1,200 to 3,000 Malaysian ringgit, eight of them are from government, 20 of them from the private, and the rest are from housewife. So this is the cross tabulation. This is the total number of from government, the total number from private and total number of housewives. So these numbers is the result of the frequency analysis is for A7, and this is for A, for example, 5, and this is for A7. But the table include the details of crossing these two variables, correct? So now maybe you ask yourself, okay, this, this, this distribution, can I say that there is a relationship or association between income and type of job or no. So what we need to do, basically in a simple way, without any statistical test, you can calculate the free percentage. Look at here under, let me to close this one, under analyze, if I go to correlate, sorry, cross tab, I'm able to add percentage. Can you see here the percentage? Percentage within row or within column or total. Let's do calculate the percentage within column. So now see, 
copy this table again, paste. So now this table is much more detailed and we have a better picture. So we can say from 100% of subjects who receive a salary less than 1,200, majority of them are housewife, followed by private and the minority is from government. For those people who receive a salary between 1,200 to 3,000, a still majority are housewife, same pattern, but the frequency are different from this group, right? And for those subjects who are receiving salary between 3,000 to 5,000, this pattern change. The majority of them are from government and then the rest followed by the private and housewife. Same pattern with what you call it for more than 5,000. Can I say that a relate, there is a relationship between type of job and salary or income? Probably yes, there is something, but how we can prove it? So this, actually this percentage I calculated according to what? According to column. This percentage was calculated based on the column. So it is possible for me also to change it to the row. So it, it's up to you which one you want to report, which one you want to emphasize. So if I copy this table again, I go down, down here, and then this time I copy this table. Now look at here, from 100% of people from governments, majority of them, they receive a salary more than 3,000. But people who are from private, majority of them, they receive a salary between 1,000 to 3,000. And majority of people are housewife, they have a salary less than, for example, 3,000. So is there any different pattern? Yes. But is it significant or not? Then we need to do a test. Significancy, just we do it to be able to generalize our findings. Right now, with this descriptive statistic, we are able to explain the relationship. Yeah, probably there is a relationship, yes, because people who are from government, they receive more compared to the other parts. So what I need to do, I can add under cross tab, we have a statistic. Under a statistic, we have chi-square. So remember, in this table, I showed you, for example, the gamma, summers, candles, phi, uh, Cromer's contingency table, lambda, lambda, uncertainty coefficients, all of them are here. Look at here. This is nominal. If both variables are nominal, you can use the contingency tables, phi or Cromer's, lambda or uncertainty. So all of them can be applied if two variables are nominal. If two variables in the row and column are uh, ordinal data, then you can use the gamma, summer, scandal, correct? And if this correlation is Pearson correlation, and this chi-score is very general, no matter whether they are nominal or ordinal, ordinal, you can use it if it's combination between nominal and ordinal. The cup, the eta is not any more common uh, it's nominal by interval. Of course, you can measure the copper risk and McNamara. I don't want to talk about this one. And Cochrane and Mental has uh, what do you call it? The Hansel test statistics. This uh, we will discuss in the future if we have another workshop. But at this level, we just look at the chi-score level, chi-score test. Run it. So when you look at the chi-score test, as it can be seen here we have a p value as well correct so let me to put it again to excel to be able to explain it clearly so now we have the chi score value and p value this asymptotic significance two tail is your p value but two tail So the problem is here, there is sometimes it happen below cell, this is very important, please, please make sure that you check this message always. If you see that there is no cells, this is one of the assumption of chi-square test. 
make sure that in your table, there is no any cells with expected count less than five. If there are, if there are some cells that they have expected count less than five, then you cannot report this p-value. If you saw some message that cells, they have some expected count less than five, you need to run another test. And what is that test? Under cross-tab, under exact, we have exact test. The exact test or Monte Carlo. So, but common techniques is exact test. Sometimes maybe your computer is stuck because of the, uh, what do you call it? This is based on data simulation, of course. You can check the Monte Carlo. But common techniques is, tech, is exact test. If I run it, now in the table, it takes time. Look at here. Now finish. After we run the exact test, we have another p-value. So look at here, we have exact test. So means if this cells is more than one, then you need to report the exact test. If it's equal to zero, then you can report the normal p-value. But again, we have exact one-tailed as well. Correct? So this is very important especially for those people who work in medical science. They, this is common issue that I faced with many of my clients in faculty of medicine. Unfortunately, they stop at this level. And while there are many cells with low numbers, but unfortunately they report this p-value. This is bias. If you have some expected count less than five, it is not recommended to use that p-value. Let me to check, maybe there is some cells. Let me to check, cross tabs, turn off the exact, and then select this three also. Maybe I can find some cells. Okay, can you see here? A7 and A6, below this table, copy, paste. So as you can see here, there is a message. Three cells, they have expected count less than five. Can I report this p-value? No. What I need to do? For the relationship between A6, and A7, I need to run the cross the exact test. So it means A6 and A7, I need to run the exact test. Sometimes you can limit the time by two minutes. This process, it takes time. If, as you can see here, it's a kind of uh, iteration. So iteration is working, it's kind of data simulation. Sometimes it takes long time, especially when your table has many level in the row and column, it takes time. That's why uh, maybe you limit the simulation process based on the time, maximum two minutes. Right now my computer is stuck <laughs> because it is six by five and the system need to simulate 30 cells thousand times. So this process sometimes cannot be finished even within two minutes. That's why if you face with this problem, then easy way to convert it to the Monte Carlo simulation processor. Look at here, again, it started from one. So I think I have to stop my SPSS and run it again because, yep. Okay, done. So look at here. It was not calculated. Sometimes, because I limit it into two, two minutes, sometimes it cannot be calculated. So in this case, we can change it to the Monte Carlo and run it with Monte Carlo. 
Monte Carlo, it's, it's faster. With Monte Carlo simulation data, you can see here the significance at two tail and one tail. So if you have a problem, actually this is based on 10,000 samples table. So this is based on the simulation. Exact tests sometimes will not give you the results because of the, the system will not be available to simulate the data. Correct? So because as you can see here, some of the cells in my cross tab, let me to show you. Some, some, oops, sorry. Some cells in my table, as it can be seen here, they are zero, zero, right? Can you see here? Two, zero, zero, very low frequency. So what you need to do, sometimes maybe you combine these two groups together and reduce the number of categories. One way to solve this problem ignoring the exact test and just combining the category. So means the income salary, when they are low frequency, maybe you merge these two groups together and then increase the sample size. Clear? Yes. So this is the point. This is the main, the most important point when you are dealing with uh, low frequency cells in your observation. So some of the species, yes, uh, depends on the, what you call it. Uh, yeah, it is not available for some of you. Uh, this, especially the one that is unfortunately, I don't know why, the one that uh, UM provided in their PTM website I don't know why they did not buy that options because when they order um, softwares, they can customize it, right? I don't know why the, the people who order the SPSS for UM, they customize it and then they did not include that modules. But I think most of you probably, they, you can see these options, right? Uh, Noor Nadia, you talk about Fisher exact test. Actually, Fisher exact test is for can be calculated for two by two tables. Automatically, the SPSS only calculate the Fisher exact test if you have two by two cross tab. You don't need to run the exact test separately. But if your tables are more than two by two, for example, three by two, three by four, four by four, then if the if there are some cells less than 0, 0.0, uh, sorry, if there are some cells uh, with the low um, expected count less than five, then you have to manually do the exact test. And of course, the, the, the softwares that we have in UM, the one that uh, is licensed under UM, uh, and no, does not include that options. Clear? Actually, Fisher is also is a kind of chi-square test, right? It's only talk about p-value Fisher exact test. It is just adjusted and corrected p-value. That's all. And SPSS, let me to show you when you have two by two table, let me to find another data set, the binary data. Suppose that this is my data, I have gender, and I have decline. So when I want to correlate between gender and declines, cross tab between gender and decline, cells, row, and then statistic chi square. So now it's two. Oh, it's not two, gender three. So I have to remove the gender three. So gender three is missing data. I think I have to select three as a missing data. Now we run it again. So now look at here. When you run, when you run two by two table, the system, the software, SPSS, 
will give you the exact feature exact test right and you have the p value for exact test so it sounds same for when you run it under exact test manually correct it will be same welcome any question for your information we will we will finish the the morning session by 12 30 friday and then we will back at two no question good so now this is all kind of uh, what do you call it uh, bivariate relationship now i want to talk about uh, before ending the relationship i just want to talk about uh, under analyze correlate we have partial correlation so do you know what does it mean partial correlation any idea small relation no Partial relation, partial correlation coefficients. Anybody? How many peoples do we have today? 68. Oh, yesterday was almost 90, 80 somethings. And then we have another, maybe it's 15 sub 15 or 20 dropped. <laughs> So probably they hit statistic. <laughs> okay, what does it mean? Partial correlation. No idea. Okay, so remember the partial correlation coefficient is a pure relationship between two variables when other variables are assumed to be constant. Correct? So when we do the correlation coefficient, for example, in this data, when we do the correlation between, for example, psychological and environmental, so let me to stop. Analyze, correlate, bivariate. Suppose that when you want to look at the relationship between psychological and environmental, so how much is the relationship between psychological and environmental? 788, right? Correct? But we know that potentially there are some other factors may affect on this relationship. So it means other factors may be, come, I, mean, I mean, interfere and affect on this relationship. So what shall I do? I can exclude the effect of all of them. If you want to look at the pure relationship, what you need to do, you need to go to the partial relationship, then you can put the social environment and psychological, and then you can control for all other factors. You say that, okay, for example, the type of job, all these factors, look at here. It is adjusted relationship. When I adjust it, the correlation coefficient, does it change too much? Yes, a bit. From 788, it changed to the 789. Actually, it means the other confounders has no impact on this relationship. So this is a kind of covariate analysis for relationship. That's why, as you can see here in the table, in the table In the table, we have controlling variables. So now, this is relationship between environment and psychological. And it is significant. While we control this relationship, for other factors. So means we assume that they are constant. So we fix the value for all these, and then we look at the relationship between, this is called pure. 
or adjusted relationship. You got it? Yes. So, okay, look at here. So last time I adjusted, now I want to adjust it by physical and other component as well. I want to just look at the pure and the, the, the actual or real relationship between these two without contributing a physical or social relationship. Now look at here, what happened? Oops. So the pure relationship between psychological and environmental, when I fix the physical or social relationship or quality of life is how much? So this is the real correl actual correlation coefficient or relationship. So look at here, how much was it before? Seven, eight, nine. And now it's almost half. So this is the pure relationship or effect or a relationship between environmental and psychological. So you can calculate because what what because when we look at the relationship between environment and psychological, since the physical social relationship also they have some relationship on these two, then this relationship will not be a pure or accurate estimation. So that's why by using the partial correlation, you are able to control, you are able to control the, the other relationship. Is it clear now? Yes. Yes. Have you heard about that before or no? No. No. So you learn new things, right? Yes, thank you. And, and hope that you apply it. So the point is that when we are dealing with multiple aspect phenomena and outcomes, unfortunately, our estimations sometimes are not real because of interaction among our variables. So when we use the partial correlation and control the relationship, then we can concentrate more on the, the real and actual and pure relationship among the variables. Okay, hope that you enjoy these topics. Any question? Uh, doctor? Yes, please. If we have a mediator in the uh, model. Oh, Please stop about the mediation <laughs> moderation. <laughs> that is a bit complicated. I'm not talking about that. Yeah, but it's a sort of it's a it's. I'm not saying I'm not saying it's exactly the same, but yes, it's some sort of uh, interaction and relation interrelationship among the variables like mediation. But for your information, probably after Raya after Hari Raya, I will conduct a uh, one day for the first time, one day full day workshop on mediation and moderation analysis, but it will be conducted under uh, my department, social and preventive medicine department, faculty of medicine. Those people who are interested uh, to understand about the new, uh, what do you call it, techniques and advanced techniques on mediation and moderation analysis, are welcome to my workshop. Any question? No? Okay, now, so let's... Hi, uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Mahmoud. Yes? Uh, yeah, can I ask uh, regarding for the chi-square, if I have imbalanced sample size, imbalanced number of samples in the two groups, can I still proceed with chi-square? Because yesterday you mentioned that if it's a quantitative, then you will recommend non-parametric. Uh, of course, the chi-square is non-parametric test. Chi-square yeah. test, chi-square distribution is non-parametric test. Still, you can use it. But if the sample size are right now, right now, today, during the break, one of the students uh, uh, 
what you call it, uh, helped me, sorry, uh, text me, uh, texted me and asked me the same problem. In this situation, sometimes we group, we recategorize because the the cross tab is is crossing between two categorical variables. The categorical variables sometimes when the sample size in each cell is a, is a small, then maybe it's possible for you to recategorize and merge some groups together to solve the problem. But of course, you can use it. You can assist Monte Carlo simulation or exact test. Don't worry about the small sample size. But in multivariate approach, later in the afternoon session, I will discuss about logistic regression. In the logistic regression, if the sample size is too small, then definitely you cannot run multivariate techniques. I see. All right. Thank you. Welcome. Okay, so let's move to the next topic. The relationship, we finished almost uh, the, main, uh, the main parts of uh, association and relationship, of course. Uh, remember, again and again and again, this is not the, the final destiny. You have to still continue and uh, study more and read more. This, uh, this two days workshop is just a starting point, not ending. Okay, now we move to the next topics, which is exploratory. So let me to explore. Hold on, I need to check my slides. Okay, this one, no, we don't need it anymore. Don't save it. Now we are going to one of the a kind of advanced topic in a statistic, which is called factor analysis. Do you know what, what is the factor analysis? Have you heard about that? No. No. None of you. None of you knows about factor analysis. Okay. So factor analysis is actually it's a kind of it's a kind of uh, data reduction techniques. Uh, sometimes you are dealing with a huge number of variables and using the univariate analysis uh, for each outcome is, is terrible. So means, suppose that, just give you an example, <laughs> one of my students, clients, long time ago, uh, he studied uh, on uh, some sort of data from satellite because he, his major was remote sensing and GIS. He collected data from satellite and the total number of the variables that we had in his data set was 4,000 variables. Imagine an and he wanted to compare because the study was very simple. He collected data from satellite from different fields of uh, oil palm in south of Malaysia. And, but the oil palm that he selected to collect data, actually the, 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 there, was, there was different severity of a certain disease. The main objective was how we can use the satellite pictures to identify the severity of disease, or we can predict the, the progress of diseases among all palm trees or farms. So what he did, he collected data from several palm oil fields and farm uh, at different level of severity of disease. And then he tried to correlate this data with satellite information. And for example, he had five fields with different level of severity of disease, and he wants to compare all these 4,000 variables at five. So means he needed to run 5,000 ANOVA. 
So assume that, just imagine, if, if someone wants to do and interpret 5,000 ANOVA, how? Is it possible? That's terrible, right? It's a kind of suicide. <laughs> so difficult to interpret. So what actually we did, we tried instead of using each bandwidth, because the, the, the data that we received from the satellite was based on bandwidth. The, there are 5,000 bandwidth. And we try to correlate this 5,000 or 4,000 bandwidth with the severity of disease. So what we did, we tried to group the bandwidth. So those bandwidth which are highly correlated, we merge them together. So we reduce the number of 4,000 bandwidths to, for example, 20 components, 20 uh, linear, uh, what do you call it, uh, components, and we merge together. And then, instead of using this 4,000 individual variables, we deal with 20, 20 new score, and those score was a linear relationship uh, combination, a linear combination of several uh, highly correlated bandwidth. So it was very effective and it was very easy. So data reduction or dimension reduction is one of the application of the factor analysis. In social science, in human-based science, in management, sometimes, when you design a questionnaire, you can find the highly correlated questions together and you can find a name for them. For example, I'm, I'm sure that some of you maybe you face with some of the questionnaires to measure each domain, they identify several items. For example, DAS questionnaire. Let me to show you the DAS questionnaires. I think we talked about DAS questionnaires before. So this is the DAS questionnaires. The DAS questionnaires include 27 items, right? So, but some of these items are related to the depression, some of them are related to the anxiety, and some of them stress. Let me to open the other one. So these questionnaires, Initially, the researcher look at here. Some of them are related to the stress. Question number question number one is for a stress. Question number two for depression. Question number four for anxiety. So actually, the 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 original questioner, uh, the developer, designed 20 items, 21 items to measure the, for example, psychological well-being, and then when they group the items in the act based on the actual data they found three main components so the items which are highly correlated they form a new domain or subdomain correct and suppose that in a set of analyzing of 25 21 items i can analyze only three score one a score for depression one a score for anxiety and one a score for stress so the and but how we can find how we can find which items are highly correlated together by factor analysis the factor analysis is a statistical techniques which based on the correlation among some indicators and group of indi grouped indicators which are highly correlated together in the highest school uh, this is another example that always I use when I'm teaching the factor analysis. In high school, for example, suppose in a school, uh, we have several items, so, sorry, several courses, like, for example, the math, physics, chemistry, for example, uh, language, English, literature, history, art, and many, many other courses, right? 
So, analyzing of data individually, it takes a long time. So, suppose that you want to analyze the math score, physical score, chemistry score, geography scores, language, literature, and so on. So, one way is to find out the factors or components. So, when you do the factor analysis, maybe you found that, oh, these three cores are highly correlated and the rest of them are highly correlated together. Why? When you look at the items, you can say that, oh, the math, physics, and chemistry, most of these items are based on what? Based on the logic. So, of course, students that they have a better logic, calculation, computation skills, they always get better score from this, all this, because they are same. And people, this, this is most based on the memory, for example, literature, language, history, geography. If you can memorize this score, these courses, you can, be, you can, if you have a, you can get a better score or mark. If you have a low memory, of course, your score will be low. So means this course are highly correlated together based on what? Based on two hidden aspect. This variable is called hidden variables. We sometimes we call it latent variables. So exactly what factor analysis is do is finding the variables are highly correlated statistically and creating a new variable. And this variable is called components or factor. Of course, dealing with these factors and components is much easier to analyze all these data individually, all these variables individually. Just remember my example. 4,000 variables and five groups. If I want to do ANOVA, 5,000 ANOVA. So what we have done, what we did actually with my students, we group these 5,000 or 4,000 variables to some of them we remove. Some of them we keep it and we form 20 components. And that 20 components, we try to correlate 20 components to those five categories, five groups. And then we finally we found that two components are very, they have a strong relationship with the disease severity. And within each components, we find that which wavelength is the most contributing wavelengths. So how easy we manage a huge number of variables and we reduce it. And then at the end of the story, we develop a model. Is it clear? Did you get the point? I hope yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. You, you find the point, right? You find the importance of the factor analysis. Okay, let's do the factor analysis together. Uh, give me a second. I need to open my data. Hold on, please. Uh, factor analysis. Is Q5 and then Okay, let me to share my screen. Give me a second, I need to turn off the aircon, sorry. It's too cold here.
Okay, can you see my screen now? Yes. yes. Okay, so uh, this data, including 34 questions, a researcher designed 34 questions to measure the, what you call it, the quality of uh, some services in the in a website. So he designed some of items related to, for example, the security, appearance, and he distributed the questionnaires among some of the students, some of the, what you call it, users, and they asked them, please rate all these components in the, in the website. So the point is that, again, we have 34 items. Some of these items probably are highly related and we want to find the pattern. We would, find, we would like to, 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 to find the, the correlated items together and we want to form the components. So in order to do the factor analysis in SPSS, you go to the dimension reduction. Under dimension reduction, we have factor and also the correspondence analysis. The correspondence analysis is a kind of factor analysis for nominal data. Factor analysis is only applicable for the quantitative data. Okay, so this, all the 14 items, we divide it, and we want to look at the dimensions under dimensions who are, uh, can, can be find can be found under these 34 items. So what I need to do after we select the items, can you see here the extraction? Extraction is the method of defining or finding the components. So there are several techniques for extraction of the components. Principal component analysis is, is the one of the commonly used techniques. We have unweighted and generalized least square, ML and principal axis factorings, alpha factorings. Again, if you want to know more about these details and techniques, so the SPSS already provided some information, uh, for, the, for example, for the maximum likelihood, uh, which is based on the observed correlation matrix is from a multivariate normal distribution data. So principal X is factoring. So I don't want to go through these details. Of course, if anybody interested to know more about the factor analysis, you know how to find it. Very simple. Go to the help and then read more. And of course, you can find more references regarding to the uh, each of these techniques. But as a common techniques, in many resource, the PCA is a, one of the common techniques in, in terms of extraction of the components among uh, items or what do you call it, indicators. So as I mentioned, the core of factor analysis is, is based on the correlation matrix. So remember this morning we talked about covariance and correlation. The correlation actually is the same as covariance, but it is a standardized. So usually when you are using items at different scale to standardize it, use the correlation. But some specific situation, we can use the covariance. Okay, we use a steel correlation. We don't, we don't want to move to the covariance, the common techniques. And then extraction. Extraction is based on the Egan value. The Egan value is the amount of variance that can be explained by a component. So remember, at the end of a story, we want to we want we want to group and create components, and then we want to know how much of the percentage of the total variance of data can be explained by the new components. The extraction, the extraction of the components is based on their contribution. 
or based on the percentage of the variance. So usually in SPSS, it works based on the eigenvalue greater than one. So now we continue. So I'm talking about rotation and other things later. Let's run it. So at the initial step, the SPSS and this algorithm assume that all the items are equal. Their weightage are equal. But during the extraction, each item's contribution can be different from others. So if any items has low contribution, or we call it communalities, the communalities is the amount of the sharing variance uh, for each items. If this value is less than 0 0.3, we have to drop it. We do not need to include it in two-factor analysis. According to these results, as you can see here, all the communalities are above 0 0.3. So that's good. So means we do not need to exclude any items. So this is a screening phase. Followed by that, we need to check, OK, we had 34 items, correct? And now we want to see this from these 34 items, how many components can be extracted? The SPSS, let me to copy this table in, in a As you can see here, the total number of components which have been extracted in this analysis is seven. Sorry, six. Why? Because the eigenvalue less than zero, sorry, less than one, were not included into our analysis. All the, these are the eigenvalue. The eigenvalue more than one this is the amount of variance for each component. So in this study, we found that if we group and if we categorize our indicators into six components, the last components still has acceptable value for the variance explanation. Of course, always the first component is the best component and means the, uh, the, the, the value or the percentage of the variance that can be explained by this component always is the highest. As you can see here, there is a descending trend in terms of the percentage of the variance. The percentage of the variance is nothing, don't worry. It's, it's very simple. Look at here, we, in this study, in this study, we have 34. 34 items and the percentage of the variance is the ratio is the ratio of the eigenvalue for each component the eigenvalue of this component divided by let me to click here again divided by 34 so now look at here how much is this value if I multiply by 100%, if I multiply this value by 100%, then it will be percentage. So now look at here. If I sort, if I round it by three digit, it will be same number, right? Look at here. If I drag it, if I drag it and drop it, it will give you the same numbers as here. We have 34 samples, and this is the amount of variance for the first component. So means the first and most important components is component one, always. And the ratio of the variance that can be explained by this component always is the highest. So the eigenvalue above one is considered as acceptable number of the components. So if the value is less than one, we do not consider it as a component. So this is according to this threshold. Later, I will discuss whether this threshold is 
acceptable and uh, what you call it reasonable to be used or not. Uh, there is another doubt. I will explain it later in the afternoon session, hopefully. So now, according to these results, 34 items, 34 items have been reduced to six components. So means we have six components. And where are the components? If you go to the results, followed by the total variance explained, you have another table, component matrix. If I copy this table, So now, if you remember, the, the system, the software, reduced and created, sorry, created six components. Of course, in each component, some of the items have more contribution. So these numbers that you can see in this table are called loading factors. Loading factors, Loading factors is the amount of correlation between each item and components. So means loading factors means the R between the item with component. Each R, again, the loading means the contribution of each item to the components. So as you can see here, in component number one, the highest, the highest loading belong to belong to 65561 6363 uh, I think probably this one so means in the component one the most important item is number 4 followed by oh this one 66 six. so but the problem is here we do not use this matrix because this matrix does not show <coughs> The unrotated, this is unrotated. So as it can be seen here, all the, according to these results, item number one, the highest loadings is in component one. The other loadings are very low. So means this item belongs to the component one. Item number two, again, the highest loadings belong to these two components. Item number three, again, belong to component number one. Item number four, number one. Number five, belong to component number one. Six, component number one. Five, seven, number one. Eight, number one. So how? All the items, they have the highest loading in component number one. So means, can I say that the other components has no any contribution? So this table, we don't use it. The reason is that when we want to calculate the relationship between item and components, we need to use the rotation. The rotation indicates that we, we try to find the distance of each item not in two-dimensional space, on multi-dimensional space mathematically. And then we try to find out these items is much more close to which components. You don't need to do it manually because SPSS has option rotation. One of the common techniques for rotation is very max. But again, if you are interested, know more about rotation, then you can. Let me to also look at the loading plots. If I click OK, now look at here. 
after rotation, can you mute your microphone? Sorry. Excuse me. Thank you. After rotation, I just copy after rotation. So this is called rotated component matrix. Now, component number one, after rotation, the highest loading was observed to which component? Three. Honestly. Item number eight, the highest loadings observed for component number five. As you can see here, number nine, the highest loadings, the highest loadings, the highest loadings, the highest loadings. Oh, these items, these items all from number eight to number 13, the highest loadings belong to component five. That's why we can put a name for this component. For example, we put the name of X and all these items, and these items are less correlated with other items. Look at here. The correlation of these items with other components are very small. So now let's to look at the other one. Here, number 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, oops, 18, yeah, and 19. These items all belong to component number, number four. So, so means these items all belong to component four. These items belong to component five. So, these items all belong to component number three. So now look at here, how easy we can find the components. So these components all belong to number two, because this is component number two. And, and yes, this is all belong to component number one, C1. Correct? So now I can see that, I can see that a pattern, I can find the pattern. But to make it easy in SPSS, what you need to do, you just need to go to analyze, under dimension reduction factor, under option, we sort it by size, and suppress a small loadings less than 0.4. So usually the, if the loading is less than 0.4, we can drop it. Continue, okay. Now look at this table. Can you see this table? How easy and nice. You don't need to kill yourself to identify the factors. Very simple, component number one, item 31, 32, 33, 34, 28, 29, 34, 30, blah. So the component number two, so this is the most important component, followed by this, followed by this. So now we have a very nice pattern. So that's why the researcher later, they can find the name. Oh, the component number seven, Six actually is single item. So maybe we drop it. So the factor analysis is how easy make a pattern among the items. Then as a researcher, you need to go and look at the items. Oh, these items all talking about the website. Oh, these items all about talking about, for example, uh, something about marketing department. These items all talking about the customer. These items all talking about, for example, the quality of the products. And these items all about the price. So then, mainly, then, in instead of talking about single, 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 single items, I studied, look at the website, marketing, customers, 
quality process and also the price. So which one easier for you to calculate? Of course, looking at this domain, look at here, the, the, the depression, we don't analyze individual items. We calculate the score. That's why if you look at the DAS questionnaire, if I'm not mistaken, maybe we can find some of them. DAS scoring questionnaire. Look at here, these questions, if you calculate the score for question number 6, 1, 8, 11, 12, 14, 18, you can calculate the score of stress. So then you can calculate the score of stress, SAD, and then if your stress score is below, for example, 10, you are your normal people. If your score is between 11 to 18, you have a mild 19, 26, moderate, 27 to 34, severe, and above 35 is extremely severe. So for the anxiety. So the guideline can be uh, can be formulated later. First of all, they define the items. Followed by that, they can develop the scoring and guideline to identify the level. Clear? Yes. Can I ask about once we, have, we categorize those items into the components, then how do we, I mean, in each item, how do we like analyze each item, like average them? Yeah, get the, yeah, actually, there are two things. The simple way is to merge and summation of the items. We, we put the scoring, like, for example, in this study, we found that item number, for example, number one, Look at here, this is item number one, hold on. These items, number one, two, three, four, five, six, right? And seven, they are all about what? About customer satisfaction. Okay, I go to my data, I go to the transform, compute, and then I put the CS. Total, customer satisfaction total. And then I put item number one, plus two, plus three, plus four, plus five, plus six, and plus seven. Okay, so now at the end of my data, I have the score. This is the total score of what? customer satisfaction. And then instead of the items, we concentrate on that. Clear? Okay, thank you. Any other question? Okay, the point is that, how many factors should be extracted in SPSS, which is very, still unfortunately, SPSS, is a very old techniques. Uh, later, I will introduce you some new softwares to do the factor analysis. I don't advise you to use the EFA with SPSS. But OK, I'm not saying don't do it. But since there is a better choice and options, later you can use that. OK, how we can identify the number of the components? So OK, please. Please, there are some. Oh, one more, one more things. One more things that I forgot. One of the assumption of the factor analysis is, is existing adequate variance and covariance in your data. So how we can check it? When you run the factor analysis is under descriptive statistic. Under descriptive statistic, if you can see here, there is a KMO, the KMO and Bartlett test of adversity. So when you run this test, it's very important that first, the KMO should be above 0 0.0.6. 
as it can be seen here, the KMO, which is measuring the sampling adequacy, please remember, it is not about the sample size. <laughs> I have met some people that unfortunately misinterpret, wrong interpret these topics. The KMO, Kaiser, Mayer, Olkin measure of sampling adequacy is for measuring the amount of the correlation in your in, within your sample. If the items are not highly correlated and you don't have adequate correlation or variance, then you cannot proceed with the factor analysis. The cutoff point for the KMO is 0.6. If your cutoff, if your in your data, if you have more than 0.6 KMO, then you can proceed with the factor analysis. Secondly, if the chi-score test of sphericity is significant, then you can proceed. If this result is not significant, then you are not allowed to do the factor analysis. You cannot proceed with the factor analysis. Another assumption in the another assumption is anti-image. Anti-image is correlation matrix. Correct? And it works based on the partial correlation. The off diagonal of numbers should be a small. If off diagonal numbers in this matrix are large, then again you have to exclude those variables. But how I can make anti image matrix? When you run the factor analysis, anti image. So when you click on anti image in your data, this is anti image matrix. You copy this table in Excel. And if you look at the results, the numbers on diagonal should be higher than of diagonal numbers. So all the numbers, look at here, these numbers Q1, the other numbers are smaller than number in diagonal. So for this one, all the numbers of diagonal is smaller than so if if you follow the the diagonal numbers the numbers are higher so this is for covariance if you look at the if you look at the correlation so you can see here all the numbers are high as long as the numbers are high on on the diagonal of this matrix compared to the off diagonal numbers so means you can proceed with the factor analysis so these are two assumptions and requirements one is kmo and bartlett the other is the anti image correlation again the numbers of diagonal elements should be a small value compared to the on diagonal variables. Clear? Yes. Okay, so I think we have to stop here now. It's almost 12.13. So we will be back on 2 p.m. We, we finish earlier because of Friday, Friday prayer. And we will start at, uh, yes. Uh, we, no, two can two can we start or not? Uh, up to them, up to you and them. Uh, we can start around two, correct? If you okay. Is it okay that we start at two p.m.? Yes, yes, we can. Okay, so I will meet you at two p.m. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Prof. Okay.